задоволення, які відрубали кінцівки, прирізали горло, які гвалтували і вбивали на очах своїх же дітей. Їм виривали язик лише тому, що не чули від них того, що хотіли почути. Чим це відрізняється від того, що робили терористи ДАІШ на захопленій ними території? Хіба що тим, що це робить постійний член Ради безпеки Організації Об'єднаних Націй. Руйнує внутрішню єдність держав, руйнує державні кордони, забираючи право більш ніж десятка народів на двох континентах на самовизначення і самостійне державне життя. Проводить послідовну політику знищення етнічної та релігійної різноманітності, розпалює війни свідомо, веде їх так, щоб бити як якнайбільшу кількість звичайних мирних людей. Щоб занимати як найбільше звичайні мирні міста. Да нет, вон пацаны, кто в магазине. Хлопли. Да, да. Да какой русский человек не соблюдает. Блять, чтобы вы так всю ночь и день. Как ты хотел туда, на войну, вот и поехал. Да, ну там реально пизда на все, блядь, все таскаешь. Ноутбуки, телевизоры, блядь, хат, на все, абсолютно, вообще все выносит, короче, дебилы и базы. Светлана, ты можешь ее научить? Куда они это складывают? Мы начинаем, или еще ждем? Dear friends, we are still missing one of our guests, the city mayor of Mariupol, Vadim Vojchenko, uh, but he will be joining us in a few minutes, I hope. Meanwhile, welcome to the Russian war crimes house. I'm sitting here with uh, assistant professor Yevgeny Finkel, who is born in Ukraine, grown up in Israel, now a political scientist um, at Johns Hopkins and his academic work centers on Holocaust, notably uh, the Jews of Eastern Europe, Russia and Poland. So uh, he's a specialist on this panel. We also have our most honored guests here, the men who have been through the worst, the unimaginable, and then some more. Welcome to Russian War Crimes House. We have uh, Ivan, Ivan Fedorov, city mayor of Melitopol. We have Alexei, Alexei Kuleba, the head of Kiev Regional Military Administration. 
And then we have somewhere on the screen, I hope, we have also the city mayor of, um, of Butcha. Nice to meet you. My words fail me, I have to say. And I do not feel up to asking any coherent questions from these men. But we have to. Because it is so important. It is so important that the high and mighty of this world realizes all talk about the life must go on. We must develop relations with Russia. We cannot paint Putin into corner. We cannot hurt our economies. It's just utterly unfair. You can see it in the eyes of my guests of this morning. It would be as utterly unfair as it was after the Second World War when the world celebrated on 9th of May peace. We didn't. Ukrainians didn't. Estonians didn't. Stalin was killing our men and women in woods and villages. Please, let's not repeat the history. So, I would I ask my, my guests who come from Ukraine to make their testimony of exactly why we shouldn't repeat the mistakes of history now. Please, let's start from you. Доброго ранку всім присутнім. Анатолій Федорук, Мучанський міський голова. На ваше запитання, чому не повинні повторювати ті помилки? Я вважаю, що ми на цьому етапі уже в 21-му сторіччі просто забули про ті виклики, які ми мали в 20-му сторіччі. Друга світова війна. І втратили дещо пильність. Хоча періодично погоджуюся, про це говоримо. Говоримо на різних заходах, форумах, що фашизм потрібно засуджувати. Але на превеликий жаль ми прогавили те, що маємо інше явище – расизм. Расизм в 21-му сторіччі. Тож, я вважаю, що ті виклики, які має сьогодні Україна – Європейські стоїть вся демократична спільнота світу, ми маємо спільно долати, уже аналізуючи пройдений шлях, тому що в Україні, в Україні іде фактично 8 років повномасштабна війна, а нині просто нова велика фаза цієї війни. Тож ми втратили пильність, ми втратили розуміння, того, що на планеті Земля можуть проростати ті паростки, які призводять до військової агресії. От в цьому якраз і є ця причина, наслідки якої ми пожинаємо нині. Дякую. Олексій, хто ви? Not many countries. Не ви, не багато країн Європи в 21 столітті мають військове командування. Ви з Київської області з військового командування. Ми були в Києві всього декілька місяців тому. Там не було потреби у такої військовій адміністрації. Але що, через що прийшли люди Києва, Київської області? Дякую вам за запитання. Question. I would like to explain a certain specific things which we have because of the war and basically I was appointed the head of the Kyiv military administration two weeks before the war. And when the war started uh, for all, it was a shock, and uh, our Kyiv Oblast, Kyiv region, it's a border, basically, region, and uh, we have the common border with Belarus, and we could not realize, we did not know, that practically Belarus, as a country, doesn't exist already, that it's completely under the control of Russian uh, 
The troops and on the 24th of February from, from the early morning, Russian troops uh, invaded us from the side of Belarus. I would like to explain the context. We were taught in the childhood, we were told that on the 22nd of July at 4 o'clock in the morning the German fascist occupied, started the war against the Soviet Union. For us it was uh, like a trigger, like uh, when we could differentiate because uh, between our own person and uh, the somebody else. And at four o'clock in the morning on the 24th of July, of uh, February, the head of police called me and he said that the war started. He was very close to the border and he hears the uh, shellings. Uh, he sees uh, uh, the explosions, he understands perfectly well that on the border there's a battle going on, that's what he told me. And basically I started calling to uh, my people, to the leadership of the country and in an hour I was at my office. We could not understand and we did not know how the events will de be developing, but I would like to say that all people who worked uh, in our regional administration, uh, they all arrived despite everything, understanding, uh, basically they couldn't understand how this day will end up and what will be the next day. Uh, we have, uh, we uh, basically uh, preserved, uh, we, we have the gender equality, we have many uh, women and they were all the time at their workplaces. The military administration was introduced five days after and it was introduced uh, so that there's more, uh, the, it is possible to uh, manage uh, the uh, regional administration so that all the actions are more coordinated and uh, uh, immediately after the um, martial law wa was uh, introduced, uh, the um, uh, military administration started working. You can see I'm not a military man. I don't have any military experience. I didn't uh, uh, fight anywhere. The uh, military administration, it's not about war, it's more about the fact that uh, the leadership should be very uh, clear without any bureaucratic uh, delays. The challenges that we have uh, in our region, it's very difficult to uh, demonstrate that by photographs that you see, the scale of the tragedy, of ruinations, they um, shock and we as people who were inside these events, we can just uh, transfer some emotions and we can talk about some feelings uh, yesterday was my first day in Davos and walking along this town uh, we had some time with the mayor of Bucha and I was thinking that actually Kiev region, our region, Irpin, Bucha, Gastomil, these are, we call them a little Switzerland. All people from this region know that because these were very cozy, very quiet resort towns where people would spend their weekends and uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, people were commuting from there. And I can tell you, we don't have plans, we don't have weekends, we work 24 by 7 so that we can stop the war so that we can uh, get the enemy away from our borders and also to reconstruct our country. That is what's been happening in our country and that is what we've survived. Thank you.
the floor to our friend on the screen from Mariupol, but um, but uh, it seems like uh, let's let's hope we get him back. And meanwhile, I know you are trying to speak, but I think no, 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 no. we take we take really the testimonies here first. And and Ivan, what has become of your child? And I really hope that all people who are listening to us can somehow try to mentally step into the shoes of those people now and realize one simple thing. If we enter the third cycle after Georgia, after Crimea, after Ukraine, the next time it will be all of us in Europe. All of us in Europe. But I see we are back. We, our connection is back with Mariupol. So please, the floor is yours. Please tell me. How do you see and hope the future will be? We have followed closely what has been going on. We are deeply sorrow, sorry about everything we've seen and we feel with all our hearts for you. Please tell us what do you think we could do to help? Yes, you you see, but you don't hear. We do hear now. Нет, тепер ми чуємо. You hear, but I do not hear the studio. Він не чує, він не чує. Іване, можливо, ви продовжите, а ми спробуємо відновити зв'язок. Please raise your uh, thumb. Okay, I hear you. I do not hear you, but I will tell you about our Ukrainian Mariupol so that we understand uh, how all of us on the 24th of February, unfortunately, uh, the enemy uh, invaded our country. And unfortunately, he came, as he said, to liberate our territory. I want all of you to understand uh, what is Mariupol. That's Ukrainian city, but there are certain specific features in our city. Uh, it has uh, uh, the historic Russian origin for many. There are many people who speak Russian, but that did not stop the enemy from ruining our city. Today, Unfortunately, we have a very sad statistics. 90% of the local infrastructure, schools, kindergartens, hospitals, even churches, the enemy ruined it all. Uh, they were targeting at every object of peaceful life. And they were saying that these are military objects. They ruined the maternity houses, kindergartens, schools, and unfortunately, uh, the uh, children and women were targeted by the enemy. And we have to uh, remember this maternity house where women and children and the babies were killed. Let us uh, uh, remember this uh, theater where it was written children, but that did not stop the enemy. Under the debris, there are our peace, peaceful citizen of our heroic city, Mariupol, more than 300 people. Uh, died from military aviation and uh, uh, such figures as uh, uh, those uh, uh, people from Mariupol who uh, died in the times of Second World War, more than 10,000 local population uh, was killed in two years. Hitler killed 10,000 only in two months. The enemy troops, the enemy aviation, artillery, everything was eliminating our citizens and they killed more than 20,000 local population, local citizens. And these are our citizens, citizens of Mariupol. And just imagine a little girl 
has no life in the future. She will not go to school. The mother will not uh, sing lullaby to a baby. The father will not play football with his son. They killed 20,000 population. They almost ruined our city that was flourishing, that was uh, becoming European modern city, the city of the future. But I am convinced that the evil uh, cannot win the good. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the evil uh, won in Mariupol, but the good continues to live because the life is in every one of us. And until people from Mariupol are alive, Ukrainian Mariupol is alive, while well, Ukrainians are alive, our country, Ukraine, is alive. And I believe today that we have to continue living for the sake of our future, of our children and our country, Ukraine. Ivan, you're from Melitopol. And basically, for the rest of the world, it has been extremely difficult to understand, particularly this. Russians and Ukrainians are brother nations. And many of you in Ukraine also grew up having grandparents who fought in the Second World War against Hitler. All the physical pain has been compounded by the mental pain of coming to the terms that now Hitler is living elsewhere, has ruined also the memory of the Second World War, of which many people in the Soviet Union actually were proud of on top of all the physical suffering of which we have from Butsha, from Mariupol, from Melitopol, from, from every corner of Kiev now, of, of Ukraine now, so many testimonies. What's the mental state of people of Ukraine? You know, first of all, today it's uh, directly three months when war started in Ukraine and war started in Melitopol. Three months ago, uh, at first, our citizens, Ukrainians, uh, saw the letter Z and nobody just understand what does it mean Z. But uh, especially citizens in occupied city every day, every day from these three months, every hour just see this Z and try to understand what is it. And uh, of course it's hard to understand because nobody now explain for us why Putin come to Ukraine, why Putin come to our occupied cities and uh, temporarily occupied and what does it mean letter Z. But uh, for me, especially for me and for all citizens of our cities, now it's good known letter and we can understand what does it mean. Z it means zombie because all Russians, all occupants, all racists who come to our land now zombie because they can't understand really situation because they can't understand that we are free nation because they can't understand that we have no problem with Russian language and to speak in Russian language they can't understand that it's a different things narcissists and patriots it's very different things but the zombie who come to our land and uh, in uh, first your uh, words you said that uh, in uh, uh, second world war we have uh, war with uh, fascism but now we have the same war but with fascism and uh, in uh, uh, second world war our parents our relatives uh, defend with uh, nazism and uh, we win this war and of course i know that uh, and now we will this war but now the most important situation in ukraine in occupied city in occupied city because every day racists try to make new rules every day they make propaganda that ukraine forgot for you that uh, you don't uh, you can't wait when ukraine liberates Ukraine come back and it's very hard to understand because 
our occupied cities fully blocked. Uh, citizens can't leave our cities. S for uh, two months, they can go by private cars, but last three weeks, they can't go by private cars. Uh, they can't go, they can go only to temporary occupied Crimea, and that's all. That's, that's all. And uh, of course, we try to defend our hero harem soldiers, try to do all possible and impossible to defend our land and to liberate our cities. But every day, every hour, it's very hard to our citizens. Of course, uh, I know that uh, if, when we liberate our cities, it's uh, a new stage of development our country. It's impossible to develop uh, Ukraine, it's uh, impossible to develop European Ukraine without liberate all our lands. But I hope it will be very soon, because it's very hard situation, very dangerous situation in our occupied city now. Thank you. As you hear, all our friends from Ukraine are speaking also about the afterlife. And I think after uh, Yevgeny, you have spoken about maybe the legalistic side of all what is going on. We could turn then to the afterlife for the future, for your dreams, because we really must vote to help you, to make your dreams come true. But first to you, Yevgeny, please. Thank you, Dobrohoranko. I'll switch to English now. So, yes, you're right. There is, you know, a lot of debate whether what's going on in Ukraine right now is a genocide or just crimes against humanity. I think in this room it's pretty relevant because it's not really relevant for the people sitting on this panel, how we call it. It's much more important for them how they deal with that. And we actually have pretty good understanding of what happens after. You know, the title of this panel is how we come back from suffering. And we know we studied that. We know what works, we know what doesn't. We know, for instance, that economically, 10, 15 years from now, places like Bucha or Irpino, or even Mariupol will not see that much effect of the war. That will come back. What will not come back is the, is the society. People will come back. People are resilient. We know that. People will have jobs. People will have families. The point is, what do we do next? in terms of politics, in terms of society. And that, to a large extent, it depends on the people on this panel because a lot of that will be local. Because we know, for instance, that those societies or those places will have much richer civic life because they will rebuild those places together. They will have higher levels of trust, and that is great. But there are some things that will never come back, or at least they will not come back until there will be closure. And closure does not depend on Ukraine and does not depend on people on this panel. It depends on Russia. It depends on Russia taking full responsibility for what has happened, having real accountability, not only in Ukrainian courts, not only in international courts, but also in Russian courts. And until that happens, I don't think we can fully talk about coming back from suffering. So in that sense, you know, all this talk about letting Putin to save face or compromises, it's misplaced. It's not the time, it's not the place, maybe 10 or 20 years from now. And if you allow me, actually, can I ask my panelist, co-panelist a question? Yes, please. So say, Obviously, right now, 10, 20 years from now, and even probably for you, forgiveness is not possible. But let's say for your children or for your grandchildren, what will it take not to forgive, but at least to rebuild relations with Russia and Russians? I think, indeed, that's a nice question to put and extremely early to start even thinking in these terms, but uh, yes, yes, we need to, I agree, but uh, yes, please. And since you, if you answer this question, please also take our discussion forward in, in telling us how and what we can do. What would be the most important now and a year from now? Okay, uh, really our city and our region have a close relationship with Russia Federation early. It's uh, between 2014 
and uh, really many relatives, many economic relationships, and uh, really it will be a uh, great economic result and relationship result. But now it's pos impossible because, uh, first of all, in 2014, they uh, occupied uh, part of uh, Donbass and Lugansk, fully occupied Crimea. And uh, all of our citizens just... Uh, I, c I can give you an example. If uh, Russian soldiers and Russian troops come to my native city, Melitopol, in 2014, they really can take support from our civilians, citizens. Really can take. But last eight years, change everything. And the most important, they change a mind of our civilians and uh, of our citizens. And uh, our citizens just uh, saw last uh, eight years what uh, Russians do in Donbass and Lugansk, what Russians do in Crimea, what the Russians do all over the world, what mean Russians' propaganda and Russian fascism. That's why uh, I understand that in the future, in uh, many tense years, it's impossible to make relationships with Russians, with future Russians. And uh, especially last two days we speak in uh, Davos uh, because uh, Davos in a special place when, uh, where many authorities built a future of uh, our world. And of course now we understand that we can't build future with killers, we can't build future with racists, we can't, we can't build future with Russian aggressions. It's impossible. And we can't speak about this now because first of all we need to stop war in Ukraine and stop killing our civilians, our children, our women, our soldiers. And it's enough. Not only over to you, but I mean I hear it all the time. We need to come to an agreement. We cannot, I mean, continue this endlessly. To our friends in West Yes, you can. Your predecessors during the Cold War had 50 years of strategic patience until there was regime change in Soviet Union. Yes, you can. It's tough, it's difficult when people are not dying and we hope one day Ukraine have liberated their country. But it's not for Ukrainians to fight for the survival of free and democratic world. They fight for the freedom of Ukraine. And when they are done with that, and start rebuilding their country, then the ball is back in our court. Economic sanctions need to remain as long as we have a neighbor who respects, again, international rule of law. And I believe this, on top of financial support, which we can give to rebuild, and military support, which we absolutely now need to give to Ukrainians, this is the most important and, I admit, very tough task for Western politicians. Please listen carefully to the city mayor of Pucha. Then you realize why you have to do this. Please. I will say a couple of words about Bucha, which is 12 kilometers uh, to the northwest of Kiev. From the first day of occupation, we didn't have big uh, military actions, we didn't have military units of the armed forces of Ukraine, but from the first day of occupation, a Russian aggressors started uh, eliminating critical infrastructure, social, industrial objects, multi-apartment individual houses, and uh, uh, we have only 53,000 citizens, but they w uh, destroyed, eliminated 1,343 uh, objects. And uh, stating, uh, quoting these figures, we come to the conclusion that they were uh, destroying, eliminating these objects intentionally, because these were life-supporting objects. That was something that allowed uh, the development for our community, neighboring communities, they created jobs uh, and they were filling in the budget. But actually, as of today, we can say that all the industrial capacities, logistical, logistic centers, uh, uh, shop malls are ruined. That is the small and medium, middle sized business that allowed people to feel comfortable. As Mr. Kuleba said, we are a very good. Uh, 
uh, town we were economically developing and just one month of occupation uh, took us back uh, dozens of years into the past. We will not return 419 civilians who were killed intentionally by Russians, by Russian orcs. We call them orcs because that's the uh, uh, any war, you know, has some uh, uh, rules. But here, the peaceful people who were going to the hospital or to some humanitarian hub, they were shot dead. They were killed. Uh, out of 53,000 uh, citizens in the city, I uh, saw that 3,500 uh, citizens stayed. The rest left. Uh, and we understand that these were quite young people who left, uh, those who made the decision who to stay in a month. We were surviving, we were supporting each other, and I am grateful to my citizens that we managed at this uh, repressive pressure to survive, to survive for the sake of conti to continue living to live on, and after our big victory, we will have to develop our uh, municipalities. And what we see today, people are returning, and thank God they are returning to the liberated Ukrainian town of Bucha, which according to the presidential decree is the town hero. But we have consequences of Russian troops staying there for a month jobs, humanitarian crisis. We understand that we do not want to live on humanitarian aid uh, only. And first, we appreciated it. We cannot make our citizens to get used to live uh, receiving such assistance from the government of Ukraine, from the international partners. And that is why from the first day, as local authorities, we of uh, the algorithm of coming out of this condition, of this situation in which we are, in the result of occupation and aggression. I have uh, some presentation, but I believe it would be something uh, extra. Before the war, we wanted to address the issue of creating jobs uh, in our suburb, because uh, uh, many uh, uh, citizens of our citizens were commuting to Kiev to work, and that was uh, quite uh, not uh, easy talking about traffic. But now we have these challenges. We now become became stronger. We analyze the toll, and we are suggesting to implement. Uh, some uh, state programs. Uh, we need to create certain environment to become stronger. Ivan and Mayor of Mariupol and all who are present here, they were saying that after our big uh, uh, victory, we still will have to say that this northern neighbor will not disappear. They will uh, leave the wounds and uh, in certain time, they will want again to probably do the same. And in the east of Europe, Ukraine should be the economically strong uh, forepost. Uh, and we need to defend the values which united in the past the peoples of Europe, the values for which Ukraine is uh, um, waging the war now. We are ready and going to divorce. I wouldn't understand the format. I, of course, looked into Google how it's all happening. We took some presentations with us, but that is a different discussion. And I believe. Yeah. It's so sad, but it's almost mm. beautiful. And so, Ale, we are talking. I mean, and here are people who tell about getting children on the bus and to the school, and mothers to work. Alexi. Uh, <coughs> to be very brief, I will um, talk first about emotions. It's about how we can forgive, how we can conduct a dialogue. 32 
children were killed in Kyiv region. More than 400 children are killed in Ukraine. These are not final figures. More than uh, 1,200 civilians are um, killed in uh, Kyiv region. We did not attack anyone. We did not give a single um, uh, pretext uh, for anyone to come to our land, to kill our people, our women, our children. I understand. I was asked yesterday many times, I understand uh, what it is about. It's because of the fear and that's normal. We were afraid. For the first month we were afraid when everyone was silent. Everyone was silent and our armed forces had to stand it and they did it and they became heroes for the whole world and for us we uh, made the choice, uh, uh, we understood that we are one single people. After 24, there were 10 um, percent. After 2014, we had 50 percent. Now 100 percent of people who are Ukrainians and they know what we need. Uh, I can tell you when we can start talking about things. When? We today start reconstructing our towns. We understand that we just do not want to just restore them. Instead of a nine-story building, we do not have to build a, construct a nine-story building. We will leap ahead in the development of our country. We want Kyiv region and all regions that suffered so that they are not just reconstructed, but so that they make a step forward and they develop according to all European canons and values, according to economic environment, according to uh, modern technologies, like it's happening in European countries, because we do not differ from civilized world. We know how to do that and we understand that uh, our responsibility is another thing. We know what questions are asked to us. We are ready to provide transparent, non-bureaucratic system which would allow to work for foreign companies, our companies on our territory in our country. Our people, they uh, survived uh, the Third uh, World War, and they are still surviving. And to understand why uh, they did it, for that we have all to get united. You, our partners, who we trust, together with us, have to help us make this leap ahead, so that people understand why and for what our uh, people, our children, perished, and our families suffered. We now have a task of trying to bring Vadim again into a discussion from Mariupol. Mariupol currently is not under Ukrainian control. Many people have fled. Many are in Russia. Many are in the Russian camps. Many are trying to flee back from Russia towards Western Europe. But all people we meet from that region, they say we will go back. Let us all know how Mariupol is convinced it will be free, it will be rebuilt, and its people will be back. I hope you heard us. Please. Yes, I hear. Yes, I hear. I hear. I hear well. What I can say, Mariupol has always been and will be exclusively Ukrainian city. Um, Mariupol. Uh, was not conquered by these invaders who were pressing uh, our city. And today we all have to understand, unfortunately, Mariupol is a closed uh, town uh, city and Russian occupational forces, they behave just like a country terrorist. Uh, and we need to recognize that Russia is the state terrorist and they keep more than 100,000 population in the city. They live without water, almost without food, without electricity, without any conditions for living. And we are on the threshold, unfortunately, 
uh, on the threshold of some sad expectations uh, which this situation can bring. I'm talking about epidemiological situation. We are on the uh, verge of some economic changes. We see that unfortunately Mariupol cannot uh, do anything so that hospitals work, so that there are medicines there and there might be infectious diseases there and all of these infectious diseases uh, like plague, they can take uh, thousands of Mariupols and we need to get united around Mariupol to restore the green corridors so that people from Mariupol can get evacuated to the uh, part of our country which is under governmental control. But we see that Russia doesn't want this to happen. They keep in prison our Ukrainians who are waiting for evacuation. And that's why we get, need to get united as soon as possible to have it happen. Why? Because we see that the war already took uh, the lives of 20,000 population and the epidemics could uh, um, take the lives of uh, thousands more. Ukrainian companies have been created during this war in Ukrainian e-governance system, Trambita. Do you know, and all our viewers as well, that Ukrainian children are still able to go to the Ukrainian e-school and continue e-learning wherever they are globally? This is the line, the lifeline which brings us from happier days of yesterday, even if it was still war since 2014, while all this has been developed, to today and then from then on to the future. How much more resilient are countries like Ukraine than a regular analog country would have been, do you think? Right. So, so I didn't know about the number of companies, about the e-learning. I do know because we have a family from Kharkiv, my wife's friends living with us and she's studying online for two months. So that I do know and I also know about other projects done by Ukrainian Global Universities, which is an initiative of Kiev School of Economics to give education for displaced Ukrainian students. So that I know, I mean, look, I think looking forward, the issue is not the resilience of Ukraine, the Ukrainians. Ukrainians are super resilient and unfortunately used to rebuilding their country, our country after, you know, many tragedies. So, so the issue is not what they can do. I think the issue is how we in the West can help. And for that, we need to listen to them because they need to take the lead and we need to help them rather than tell them what they need to do and come up with, you know, projects from Afghanistan or from Kosovo, from other places, they will simply not, will not work. We know that those transplants don't work. We need to listen to their voices, especially local leaders, like those sitting on this panel, tell, for them tell us what they need and for us give them what we can. Well, I understand today the most important thing is that we all in West understand that it's the Ukrainians who decide the fate of this war, but we provide. Ukrainians decide, we supply, there is no other option. And thereafter, what comes, European Union? Ivan? You know, uh, study and education in occupied city, it's uh, uh, one of the main topic. I want to show an example. Uh, two months ago, uh, occupants want to restart education process in our schools, in our kindergartens, and uh, please pay attention all chiefs of schools in Melitopol didn't agree to work with occupants. All, all of them come to uh, new pseudo uh, representatives and say it openly. After this conversation, four of chiefs of the school was kidnapped and bring to prison. But uh, they have a strong position. Now we have uh, new challenges. New challenges, for example, uh, those children who end school and now need to invite universities. Uh, those children who finish school and now need to take documents of education in schools for inviting university. But uh, we need to give support to all of them. We need to special rules for all of them because uh, we, need to, uh, we can't do any steps those uh, bring our children to Russian Federation. We must to give 
main support, strong support to our children, special rules to give to them possibility to live uh, occupied territories, to invite to Ukrainians uh, and maybe Europeans universities and to help them to be our future. Але з вашого yes, дозволу я доповню трішки, що, що стосується дітей і освіти. To children and education, let's recognize that until the 24th of February, before the beginning of the war, we had a successful reform. It was administrative, territorial and educational reform and the level of digitalization, which covered all the educational space, allowed us and to having such challenges as COVID, Russian aggression, to support the education for children. And I appreciate all these uh, teachers, not of just my city, but in general, because that was all over the country, all the uh, people in the educational sector. That was like a third very important front line. The first one is uh, armed forces, the rear, which uh, provides for economic strength of the country. And the third one was education now, uh, which is directed to the future, this, uh, irrespective of where the child is in Ukraine or on the territory of European country. Uh, uh, but uh, education uh, is uh, accessible for our children. And from our first days of the occupation in our Bucha community. We had no electricity, no good communication, but we were using generators and we opened schools, some educational establishments where it was possible. And today we are thinking, even during the occupation and military actions, we are thinking about future, about children, children now, our future. Thank you. I would like to say that it is important how we'll be uh, uh, studying, where will our children be uh, studying, but it is important what they will learn. Uh, seven years ago, I was in Croatia together with children, with the family, and I could not understand why they have Croatian music everywhere. If you've heard it, you will understand me. It's very specific, but it's everywhere. I was in a taxi, a young guy was a driver, and he was listening to Croatian folk music very loud. And I told him, maybe you don't know, there's Queen, there's Beatles, there's you too. But he says, no, from my early childhood, I know that Croatian music, our folk music is the best in the world. I don't need Beatles, you too. I will listen to Dalmatia, I remember it. And uh, I believe that for us, for me personally, it's realization of the fact how it is important. It is important whether they have the computer or iPad, but it is very important that they learn our Ukrainian folk song, our Ukrainian folk culture, and thanks to that, they will be developing. And maybe in 20 years, my child will be driving and will be listening this Ukrainian folk songs very loudly. And I will try to, I'm sorry, but to make a joke, let's help Russians with iPads. Yes, with the um, uh, toilets uh, and other things, all the schools. Uh, where Russian troops were, they say that the notebooks and iPads, well, uh, were stolen. These are not super powerful things, but they were stealing it all. And how to explain this detail? It's difficult. Let us help them. Maybe then they will calm down. The embassies uh, elsewhere to really make sure that your wish there comes true. But it's, it's actually maybe not about Russians as simple people. I'm sure there is still a certain amount and a big amount, as we know from the Soviet times. If somebody calls and asks, do you support the Soviet, Soviet Union? You say yes. Similarly, you support whatever it is called, operation. But we know Russian people actually 
are not supporting this war, neither. And they are with us. And I can tell you a little joke also from Estonia. My grandchildren go to Russian-speaking kindergarten just to learn language. And uh, my granddaughter came home and said, you know what Z means? Z means body part, which we do not mention actually in a proper society in Russian. Russian speakers now know what Z means for Estonian children. And we will actually might need to take arms up and defend our country as well. Our children, grandchildren in Eastern Europe are now also growing up thinking military solution might be someday necessary. It's horrible, but they are ready to stand for freedom and democracy. And I repeat, my grandchildren are Estonian, but they go to Russian-speaking kindergarten and they get it from there. This is a proof to you that this kind of Ruski mirror doesn't exist, what Putin says. I heard about one prime minister going to Kiev and the rockets were flying over. And then he said, which was most astonishing, Ukrainian people were saying, this will all pass and then we will join the European Union. Is this one of the dearest wishes now for development for Ukrainians? Uh, it's not the wish, uh, European Union and uh, European development, it's uh, maybe not now our, now our national idea. And uh, today, uh, Ukraine, Ukrainians uh, pay a huge price for our choice in 2014, huge price. And of course, from our partners of uh, European family, we just wait now a united position because uh, Ukraine's defend not only for Ukraine, Ukraine's defend for safe life in a lower Europe also. That's why it's our national idea to be a part of European Union. And in 2014, uh, Ukrainians trust us and trust European family. And now we can't make another choice. We are partial here, of course, me too. I represent, yes, Yalta European strategy. So I've been, I mean, fighting for Eastern partners, particularly Ukraine's place in the EU for a long time. What's your impartial view? Will it happen? Uh, honestly, I don't think anyone knows. I mean, it's very much in the open. I really hope that in June, Ukraine will get the candidate status and then it will be up to Ukraine what kind, you know, I think it's more up to you, right, as as members, members of the European Union, what I as an American can, you know, can tell about, about this. But if, I think if the candidate status does happen, then the road is wide and open. It, it will obviously take years, right? Let, let, let's be honest, Ukraine will need some rebuilding, both physical rebuilding and also institutional rebuilding. But the candidate status will give that, will give that opportunity both financially and politically. And I absolutely agree. Looking at Ukraine right now, it is, it is a national idea. I mean, and it has been a national idea for years. Just now it finally has become possibly a reality. Yes, I would really like to know why Ukrainian people think European Union will help them to solve I can issues. Answer. I can answer. Now Ukrainians defend for European Union else. If in June Ukraine don't, don't have candidate status, it's a big question. Will be Ukrainians defend for European Union? Also Ukrainians will defend for Ukrainian. But it's a big question. Will we defend for European Union and European safety or not? We hope you will, please. No, я з вашого дозволу теж свою емоцію щодо того, що нас очікує. Your permission, I can say what is uh, what may happen in June, and uh, I would like to say a few words about where we are going. It's not related to war. The countries of the European Union that make decision as to accession of uh, Ukraine or about the status of uh, the candidate country but they are creating some uh, uh, artificial obstacles uh, and they are delaying the process. We can state that from 2014, Ukrainian people made their choice and they are moving uh, ahead and they are proving that we are part of this space and the challenges that we have, the war just confirms that we are not just defending our land we are not just defending our independent sovereignty territory population, but we are fighting for values, 
for values which are all over the democratic world. But at the same time, some politicians at the European continent, uh, they say, let us not uh, uh, be in a hurry, let's delay. I don't understand it. They tell it to me and I say, as the citizen of Ukraine, how could it have be like that? It shouldn't be like that in civilized world. Thank you. Alexey. The last word to uh, Mariupol. Uh, Vadim will get to close our panel, so just try to be concise and then over to you, Vadim. Of our president, I would say that yesterday he said that we need to act today. We don't need to uh, delay. We don't need to think. We need to act. We need to make specific steps and make specific actions. And we uh, give our stretch our hand uh, so that we can demonstrate our efficiency. This could be a pilot project of restructuring Kyiv region. That could be a session of Davos in Bucha. But these should be very practical, very specific actions that will show to the whole of the world and first of all to our enemies that we are not alone, that European values are common for us and that only by these specific steps will be able to win fast when people ask when will this finish when there are specific actions from both sides then this will end up much faster thank you e mer mariupolia bud laska I'm sorry, can you hear now? I've heard the main thing today. We don't have... From... We don't have to uh, uh, delay our victory. We saw what happened in 2014 when there was a delay, what it led to. Today, what Ukraine has is this big war that takes thousands and dozens of thousands of our Ukrainians. And we need to get united for the sake of the victory of Ukraine. Why our state is fighting and what for we are fighting, for our independence, for us to be in the center of Europe so that we are a modern European city of our modern European country. We all have to understand if we continue to finance this enemy that is called Russian Federation, then there will be similar ruinations like in Bucha, in Irpeni, and Mariupol. How many more uh, Mariupols, Buchas, or Irpens we need to understand that there should be embargo on oil, on refinery products, so that we stop financing the enemy? It brings only murders. And what they declared, they declared that that's an operation of liberation. But we see that this is genocide of Ukrainian people. We today have to get united around the victory of Ukraine. If Ukraine wins, Europe will win. So let's go together to victory. Thank you all. you've seen free citizens of the free world please support your politicians to do the right thing support ukraine now this is supporting freedom and democracy globally we are very grateful to ukrainians and we stand by you thank you all for being here with us today thank you for your support thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.